Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to the Heidi St. John podcast. Today, I'm going to air part two of my interview with Seth Gruber, and we're going to talk about the story of Hans and Sophie Scholl, who are the inspiration behind the White Rose Resistance. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. So welcome back to the show. I'm glad you guys have joined me here for the Off the Bench podcast. I'm going to air part two of my interview with Seth Gruber in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to let you know that we are getting ready to launch an exclusive subscription service to those of you who are committed to listening to this podcast and want to hear more. And we would love your feedback. And so I'm going to encourage you to go over to the show notes today. And we're going to have a questionnaire for you to fill out. We want to know what your thoughts are. Uh, for a subscription service here at the Heidi St. John podcast. What we're talking about is live time with me, uh, discount codes, extended podcasts, exclusive interviews, private forums for the off the benchers, a behind the scenes look at what it takes to put the podcast together, exclusive merchandise, a whole lot of other things. We want to hear from you and we'd love it if you would fill out that questionnaire so that we know exactly how to craft a unique subscription service for the off the bench podcast. We appreciate you guys. We're looking forward to what uh, God is going to do here at the show in 2023. And right now, without further ado, is part two of my interview with my friend, Seth Gruber. When they hijack the language, you hijack the culture. And the church, frankly, has been complicit in this, right? Because we have soft-stepped the issue of abortion. We've soft-stepped homosexuality. We we soft-stepped gay marriage. I know a lot of Christians who were... Uh, you know, jumping up and down, not the least of which is President Trump, who claims to be a Christian, who just had a celebration for the so-called Respect for Marriage Act at Mar-a-Lago. And these people are celebrating wickedness. And and the church has a, an obligation to speak into the void. And yet we haven't done it for a very long time. That's right. Yep. Yes, Heidi, very well said. Um I want to I want to share one thing here with your listeners Heidi because I think that this season with the scamdemic and the shutdowns and the enemy overplaying his hand it's awakened a lot of people that we didn't think would get awakened mm, and and Charlie true. Cook and Rob McCoy and Jack Hibbs have done such an incredible job really Rob and Charlie with Turning Point USA Faith aligning mobilizing and bringing people to the table to create a network a united front of believers who are who are finally willing to abandon the old Tim Keller, Ed Stetz, or Russell Moore talking points, right, of waiting downstream to pick up human heartache that you helped create, as Pastor Rob says, mm-hmm. through your political abdication upstream mm-hmm. uh, and plucking people out of the streams of death before they fall in it. And that means contending for righteousness in the political sphere, in the public square. Um, but I, I think with so many people getting awakened, I think God, God has given his people little signs of providence, right? And providence is when God winks, right, Heidi? Um, it's a reminder that I'm still here, right? Uh, and, and God still <laughs> intervenes in the affairs of men. And so June 24th, Heidi, the day Roe v. Wade gets overturned, uh, which I was told for my generation, this would never happen. It would never happen. Exactly. It was so fascinating. Um, June 24th is the nativity of St. John the Baptist. Now, I'm a Protestant. I'm not a Catholic, but I will say this. I will give this compliment towards the Catholics. They do follow the religious uh, calendar much better <laughs> uh, than, than most Protestants who couldn't even tell you the, the Christian calendar. And so this is fascinating. I mean, come on. Okay, so what's the nativity of St. John the Baptist? <laughs> Heidi, it's when we – it's the day that we celebrate Mary visiting Elizabeth. Oh, wow. And the prenatal John the Baptist doing backflips in, in the womb, which I yeah. said earlier, recognizing his creator, who's also a fetus at that same moment. Uh, and so you've got two fetuses, which is a Latin word for offspring or small child for your listeners who who, who say that I'm using de- dehumanizing language. It's a Latin word for offspring or small child. But you've yeah. got two unborn babies r- r- flipping around, recognizing one another, the one another's humanity and John the Baptist recognizing Jesus's divinity, that that's his creator. And that is the day Roe v. Wade gets overturned. Are you freaking kidding me? Is that just weird? 
or is that Providence? And then June 24th, Heidi, was the um, it was a planetary alignment. I don't know if you remember this, a planetary alignment. Now, listen, pause for your listeners who are like, Heidi, kick this guy off the show. He's telling us to read the stars. Uh, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. OK, I, I know Jesus said it is a wicked generation that seeks for signs and wonders. But as one Catholic priest, George Rutler, once said, it's a stupid generation that ignores signs and wonders. <laughs> and so when signs and wonders slap you in the face, give give credit to Providence and get back onto the field of yeah. battle. Yeah. And so five planets lined up in the night sky visible to stargazers, Heidi, the day Roe v. Wade gets overturned. Venus, mm. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and one other. And literally, you didn't even have to have a telescope. You could see all five of them. It was gorgeous. So this photo goes viral all across the internet, uh, in every country, all across the world. Of this was the sh- photo getting reshared of those five stars taken by an astrophotographer. Ready for the name of that astrophotographer, Heidi? I can hardly, I don't, I'm scared to hear it. Right Dobbs. Oh, wow. Spelled D O B B S. Wow. Like Dobbs versus like Jackson the Dobbs Women's Health decision. Organization. Yes. And his first name is Right. Like they were right. In the ruling of Dobbs. I mean, so listen, I don't see for signs and wonders. You can't make this stuff up. But those are two things that are, I think, is providence. And so I, I believe God still is intervening in the affairs of men. I've spoken at more churches on the issue of life, individual pulpits, since I met you, Heidi, in the fall of 2020, than I have in all 10 years of my pro-life speaking career. Now, yes, that has to do with people like you and Jack and Charlie and Rob pouring kerosene on my, kerosene on my ministry. But I think there's a stirring happening. I mm-hmm. think people are waking up. And, and so I think we need to return to those things that we used to know. Um, mm-hmm. we, we have abandoned the robust, beautiful tradition of Christianity in this country through these myopic, truncated talking points about separation of, of uh, church and state. And then, you know, whatever the state says, I'm going to go along with that. That the, the Johnson Amendment has done more. Oh, uh, no question. It's created more havoc. And, and created more of an open door for Satan, Heidi, than almost anything else in the culture so, wars. So stop for just one moment, because there's a lot of people going, Johnson Amendment, Johnson Amendment. Explain what that is. Well, yeah. So uh, what, oh, I forget the guy's first name. for, uh, but, um, but but this was this is where we get the idea of the, the separation of church and state. Uh, and this was used to silence the yep. public voice of the church. And still it, is. Yeah, and still is. Yep. Still and so is. It's someone as, as big as Trump. Do you remember this when he said, yes. he, he was like, we got to take care of that. We got to get rid of that. Um, mm-hmm. and, and Eric Metaxas, bless his soul, when he was on my show recently, he, he admitted, he's like, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. Uh, before 2016, I didn't even know what the Johnson Amendment was. And Eric said on my show, he said, Trump, Trump informed me about what this was and how it was being used. To silence the church, which was, which is what led Eric to write books like "If You Can Keep It" and now "Letter to the American Church." Uh, and so, you know, my my dad just got me D- David Barton's Founders Bible for Christmas, you know, which I've always wanted. I've always been meaning to buy. I just never got around to it. Which hey I'm man, excited. Don't don't be too jealous because David Barton signed my Founders Bible. Oh, I'm sure when did. I saw <laughs> him in, when I saw him in Santa Barbara. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, but but things like that that the church has to return to to learn our, our robust history and heritage. So yeah. we stand on the shoulders of giants and we think that we're flying. But there, this culture <laughs> war, I always say, Heidi, it was always a proxy war yes. for the deeper spiritual war. The, the, the enemy of our souls has masqueraded his demonic assault against babies, the family, children, mm-hmm. the church, under the language of just the politics. Mm-hmm. And now in the last two and a half years, Heidi, just the science mm-hmm. to keep the politically impotent pastors silent because mm-hmm. Satan knows how many pastors fear being associated with politics, which is why when you try to talk on life in a church or I try to talk on life in a church, what are we told, Heidi? We don't do politics. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, 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 no. You only preach as much truth as the spirit of the age allows you to, lest you lose the ties of your registered Democrats whose political sensibilities you don't want to offend with the full counsel of God. That Mm -hmm. should be our response to those people. That'll preach. That'll That'll preach. preach. (laughs) Pass pass the plate, as my friend Kirk Cameron would say. You know, it it will require... Uh, if we're going to turn this around and, and I've, you know, you and I were talking about this briefly before the show today that, uh, you know, my run for Congress taught me many things. 
And I think I'm still learning, and I probably will be for a while, the lessons that God wanted me to learn in doing that. One of the main takeaways was politics is downstream from culture. Yep. And unfortunately, the church is downstream from politics. Yep. And we should be upstream from all of it. And instead, yep. we have abdicated our role. And it will require courage yep. uh, to, because these guys aren't hiding anymore. I don't know. How, I mean, how many videos do we have to see now of, of abortion uh, activists who are saying, we know it's a child. Yep. We don't care. That's we know right. it's a baby. We don't care. So they're, they're, they're now done. They, the, the damage has been done, right, by the hijacking of the culture and the softening of the language of this barbaric practice, which is the taking of an unborn human life. Yep. And so they they own it now. And so now they're not hiding who they are anymore. And they're saying, we know it's a baby. We don't care. That's right. And that is where that is where we are. You have founded an organization called the White Rose Resistance, which there's an amazing story, uh, Sophie Scholl's story behind this. I read it to my kids many years ago, and I've Very actually cool. read it on the show, which I was so thrilled really? to see. Wow. Yes, I have told the story of Sophie Scholl on my on my uh, on my podcast before. But I would love for you to tell listeners, because everybody has a, a role to play. Not everybody's going to be Seth Gruber, you know. Not everybody's going to be as uh, not winsome as you. <laughs> uh, and I think that that we we have an op- a very unique opportunity right now because mm. of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. The church actually has been given a window again because yeah. when we when we take this this conversation now, we break it down into the 50 states. It's no longer a federal conversation, which it never should have been. That's right. It's a state conversation. This is an opportunity and, in fact, a sacred moment for the church to step into the gap in their state. They yep. don't have to worry. They, they no longer have to go, well, it's a federal thing. There's nothing I can do about it. No, this yep. is in your state yep. there, mister. It's in your yep. state. You founded the White Rose Resistance. I want people to hear about it. But first, you have to tell uh, the story of Sophie Scholl. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've been aware of the the White Rose Resistance for many years, Heidi, because you know when you run in pro life circles and your pro life movement, you you learn the stories of the heroes that came before you who fought their own injustices. So I've been aware of the story for a long time, but it was it was uh, in 2021 that I started studying the story much deeper, and then I. I closed out my talk at the Love Life California conference, which was my brainchild, and I took it to Jack. And then we had, we had 1,100 people in person, 400 online in January of this year, 2022. And uh, I, I closed out the the message with that. And then the 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 story just kept kind of percolating in my heart. And I, I started studying it more. I started reading the letters. I read a book on it um, and just trying to be as, as familiar with Hans and Sophie and Christoph Probst and, and the entire movement as possible. And you just naturally begin to see the similarities. And But what was so unique about their story is it's, it's so little known. So few people know it, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. yet it's one of the most inspirational stories of Christian yeah, resistance extraordinary. Yeah, against extraordinary. the culture of death mm-hmm. in Nazi Germany. Um, and so what I'm saying is I'm rebuilding the White Rose resistance for this generation against our silent but far more deadly Holocaust of abortion. But here's the story. So in, um, in February – well, yes, in, in February of 1942 – a young woman named Sophie Scholl, 21 years old with dreams of becoming a school teacher, um, is walking the streets of Munich, Germany. And she comes across a leaflet, a pamphlet on the sidewalk of Munich, and it says leaflets of the white rose. And so she picks this thing up, Heidi, and she starts reading it. And it's explicitly condemning the crimes of the Nazis um, and asking the good people to wake up. They said things in their leaflets, Heidi, like we are the white rose resistance we are your bad conscience and we will not leave you alone. <laughs> they said things in their leaflets like, if you know, why do you not act? Right? Back to C.S. Lewis, back to screw tape letters, right? The exercising of those moral muscles. If you know, do something about it. Stop waiting for someone else to do the good work for you. Right. And so she starts reading this, Heidi. And you know what, what Sophie thinks? This sounds a lot like how my brother Hans talks. He talks like this all the time. This is really weird. It's almost like he wrote Come it. to find out, <laughs> the White Rose Resistance was not only being run, but had been co-founded. 
by none other than her older brother, Hans, um, who at 24 years old, you understand, guys, was just trying to protect his little sister. Um, he understood how dangerous his resistance activities were in 1942. And so Sophie demands to join the White Rose Resistance, and she becomes the youngest member and the only woman um, in the Munich chapter. Although for people, if you study the story deeply, their bravery actually spawned other White Rose Resistance chapters across Germany. And so for the rest of 1942, Hans, Sophie, Christoph Probst, uh, and a few other, most, mostly 20-somethings, um, end up staying late up into the night. And they would write, print, and distribute these anti-Nazi leaflets all around Germany. They would even take trains in the middle of the night, Heidi, to major German cities. And they would drop off these piles of these pamphlets everywhere. And it pissed the Nazis off. They would even graffiti <laughs> things like the White Rose Resistance or publicly condemning the Nazis on walls, on buildings, on overpasses. And then the Nazis would come the next day and, and, and paint it over, right? You can't have anything encouraging resistance in the public no, square. No, no, right. So guys, remember, 21, 24. I mean, I'm 31. Like, this is amazing. And so... They take things to the next level in 1943. And on February 18th, 1943, Hans and Sophie, brother and sister, walk onto the campus at the University of Munich. Now, one thing you guys may or may not be aware of is the universities, right? Academia was being co-opted into silence and obedience by the Nazis in much the same way that the clergy was, right? right. Unless you were part of Bonhoeffer's confessing church, of course. And right. so um, this was very dangerous. This is 1943, y'all. I mean, goodness gracious, Jews have been being burned in concentration oh. camps for years already. Yeah, this yes. is extremely dangerous. So Sophie demands to carry the suitcase full of the white rose leaflets, Heidi, because she argued she'd be the least likely to be searched. And so during class time, when the halls were quiet, Hans and Sophie begin to circle the university, dropping off piles of their illegal leaflets all across the universities. Now, guys, just to just to package this for our moment, this is no, no different than a social media campaign today. <laughs> this is pre-digital age. You got to get out information, content, awaken the people, prick the conscience of the culture, ask the church to wake up. And so expose the deeds of darkness, Ephesians 5.11. And so um, in, in this final iconic scene that's been retold in movies and books, Sophie walks to the third floor balcony mm -hmm. at the University of Munich, and she throws an entire stack of white rose leaflets down to the atrium below. Now, you guys know what happens when you throw paper, right? It goes everywhere. Um, unfortunately, the janitor, a committed Nazi, caught Sophie in the act called the Gestapo, had Hans and Sophie arrested on the spot, and they spent the next four days in prison being brutally interrogated, physically assaulted. Um, and it was as if in these four days, Heidi, Jesus would enter that cell room and pick up Hans and Sophie into his hands, and they would behave in and speak with a level of moral, spiritual clarity and courage that was lost on most of the German pulpits. Um, they refused to implicate any of their friends, but unfortunately they found incriminating evidence at their apartment, which incriminated their friend Christoph Probst, who they mm. did not want there that day because his, his wife had just given birth to their baby. And so because they were arrested, Heidi, on February 18th, 1943, they missed a meeting that they had that afternoon a man they were supposed to meet with who had been so encouraged by their bravery, he wanted to connect with other Christian resistance fighters. That man's name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And they never made that meeting. And Sophie said a couple things in her final hours of her life that have been repeated ad nauseum, but I think it's it's so key because it's that same C.S. Lewis screw yes. tape analysis that yep. if you don't act, what will happen? Not just to you, but to those who will suffer because of your abdication, your silence, and your apathy. And so here's how Sophie said it. She said, you know, the real damage, Heidi, it's not done by all of those millions who just want to survive. Oh, you know, all, all those men who just want to be left in peace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the real damage is not done by all of those millions who just want to survive. Um, uh, those who roll up their spirits 
into tiny little balls so as to be safe. And she said, safe? From what? Life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets lead to the same place as wide avenues. And a little candle burns itself out just like the flaming torch does. I choose my own way to burn. Mm. So, so Sophie's telling the quote is much longer than that. It's beautiful. But she's saying, listen, bad things don't happen because bad people do bad things. That's the story of human history. Get used to it. <laughs> the real damage is caused by all of you who just want to survive. Those who want to be left in peace. Those who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything bigger than themselves. Yeah. Those with no sides and no causes. Those for whom freedom, honor, truth and principle are just literature. Those who live small, die small. It's the reductionistic approach to life, Heidi. If you keep it small, you'll keep it under control. Yeah. If you don't make any noise, the boogeyman won't find you, said Sophie. But it's all an illusion because they die too. They die too. So what do you want to spend your life doing, Christian? You're not going to get out of this alive. There's never been a U-Haul behind a hearst. How do you want to spend your life and waste your life in this moment at this late hour in the American culture war where the FBI is targeting pro-lifers who dare sidewalk counsel in front of abortion centers, where the FBI is labeling concerned parents who speak at school board meetings as domestic terrorists because Merrick Garland is angry at all the conservatives who denied him a, a seat on the Supreme Court with the Biden administration threatening to sue pro-life obstetricians who don't want to perform abortions and sue them under discrimination lawsuits Unbelievable. for not killing a baby. How yeah. did we get here? We've been we've been getting here, Christian, for hundreds of years because people like Margaret Sanger and Thomas Malthus and Alfred Kinsey and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the David and Lucille Packard Foundation and George Soros and all of the pontiffs of progressivism, they care more about living out their humanistic religion than we have to live out our pure and undefiled religion because we've refused to care for, protect the most vulnerable among us. If we're supposed to care for the orphan, Heidi, whose life is endangered because his parents are dead. How much more ought we to care for the orphan in the womb whose life is endangered because his parents want him dead? Not because his parents are dead, but because his parents want him dead. That's an orphan far closer to the heart of God, Christian, than you could possibly imagine. And the longer that you're complicit in and apathetic towards the sacrament of Satan, the alternative Eucharist, because abortion says you must die so I can live. But Christ says, no, I must die so you can live. And we kill babies through embryonic stem cell research, fetal organ harvesting, and prenatal gene editing. Because in each circumstance, we say we have to kill the babies because we'll find new ways to extend our own life. It's an alternative creation story. It's Satan's sacrament and it's Satan's pride and joy. And that's why the left is losing their minds in 2022, Heidi, since June 24th, and why they're going to continue losing their minds in 2023, the first year without the spirit of Roe v. Wade over this country, because the high places of Moloch are starting to crumble. We could not be living in a more Kairos moment than we're in right now. We have a narrow window of time here, church, to wake up, to reassert our spiritual obligation to contend for righteousness in the public square because it's not about us. We're not selfishly demanding our rights. Guys, Heidi was not speaking out against shutdowns because she was so concerned about her rights. I don't speak out against abortion and euthanasia and chopping off the genitalia of, of teenagers because I'm so selfishly concerned for my rights. We're not demanding our rights. We're exercising our responsibility as stewards of this country and as sons and daughters of the king. But the longer you tolerate abortion, the longer you tolerate this genocide and all of the evil that flows from tolerating the killing of a baby, the sooner you will wake up and find Christian that you have now been defined mm. as Laban's Unvertens Laban, as life unworthy of life, as unwanted, as undesirable, as the next iteration in the history of eugenics that always defines some people as not fit to live. So I am rebuilding the white rose resistance for this generation 
against our silent but far more deadly holocaust of abortion to build the army of Christian resistance that Hans and Sophie dreamed of but never saw realized to end our holocaust of abortion today. So we exist to educate the public, discredit the opposition, and inspire a movement in the church. My goal, Heidi, in two years is to have full-time security around my home. Because of the pain in the butt, the stick in the eye, and the fly in the ointment that I am to the culture of death, the abortion industrial complex, and the spirit of the age, and his obsession with wiping out the image of God from the earth. This could not be a more important battlefront for our king and in this moment now. And you owe it to your children and grandchildren to be able to tell them one day that you are not a man without a chest. You are not a silent shepherd. You were an engaged watchman for our times, blowing the trumpet so that the blood would not be on our hands and our head instead. So anyways. Well, I, uh, it's worth mentioning that Sophie lost her life, uh, in, in her pursuit of defending what is indefensible. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's so good. Well, I mean, I love, I love what you're saying. I think your passion is clearly what God is blessing it will require courage and it yep. takes courage. It takes, I don't care. I don't care who you are in the culture right now. If you stand up against the spirit of the age, it requires courage. It requires courage to run for office. It requires courage to go into the public schools. It requires courage to pull your kids out of the indoctrination centers that are the government schools. It requires courage to stand up and speak for life in a culture of death. That's exactly what you're doing. But really quickly, right. finish the story and tell our listeners, because you know, they're on the edge of their seats going, what happened to <laughs> yeah, Hans yeah. and Sophie? So four days later, on February 22nd, 1943, Hans and Sophie were taken to the guillotine. Um, so this will this February of 2023 will be their, the 80th anniversary of their death. And so we're going to be planning some big things here at the White Rose Resistance in honor of their sacrifice, which has planted the seeds of resistance in the hearts of millions. And your sacrifice, Christian, will water those seeds of resistance. Yeah. So one day, thousands will be awakened and stirred to action, to love and good works. But, you know, the the prison guards, Heidi, were so frustrated um, and disturbed by Hans and Sophie's bravery that they actually relaxed the rules and let Hans and Sophie meet with their parents for a couple minutes in a side room right before being taken to the guillotine. And we have all this recorded because the prison guards were later interviewed and they were so disturbed. They did not know what to do with Hans and Sophie. And Sophie's mothers would look her doomed daughter in the eyes and her final words would be, remember Jesus, Sophie. And Sophie responded, yes, but you too, mama. And we know from Sophie's cellmate, Elsie Gebel, who later wrote letters to Sophie's parents to tell her everything that happened in the last four days of her daughter's life. Elsie said that Sophie was not so disturbed or scared of her impending death. Sophie was wrought in soul as to how her mother could handle losing two children on the same day. Yeah. Guys, this is a 21 year old. And so Hans and Sophie on February 22nd, 1943 were taken to the guillotine and right before being escorted out of her cell room, Sophie looked out her window and she said, how can Mm -hmm. we expect righteousness to prevail when there's hardly anyone willing to give themselves up individually to a righteous cause. Such a fine, sunny day. And I have to go now. But what does my death matter if through us, thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? Sophie's final words, Heidi, according to the executioner, before the blade fell, was to say the sun still shines. And Hans's final words was simply freedom, freedom. Reminds me of Braveheart, right? Um, So that's a 21 and 24 year old. But you know what, guys? Hans and Sophie never saw thousands awakened and stirred to action. There wasn't an uprising at the university and the church remained asleep. So we honor their sacrifice and courage today by building the army of Christian resistance that they dreamed of, that they knew, if awakened, could bring a grinding halt to the Nazi regime to end our holocaust of abortion today because, church, we're living through the next iteration of the eugenics history, which is today it's the unborn, 
soon, then later it's the elderly or those who are incurably yeah, ill. That's right. And next right. it will be you and yep. anyone who yep. dares stand against the sacrament of Satan. So if you guys want to connect with the White Rose Resistance, you can go to the White Rose Resistance.com, the White Rose Resistance.com. You can become an ally. You can book us for our tour at churches all across the country that we're doing in the spring as well. And then I'm doing a university tour uh, in the spring as well, Heidi, which will be fun. I think we're going to call it um, Adolf Who? Um, <laughs> Margaret Sanger's Body Count. So we're, look, we're, we're oh, looking gosh. forward to that one. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Seth Gruber, it is an honor and a and a, just a delight really to have you here. Thank you for sharing the story of Hans and Sophie Scholl and reminding us that uh, there are causes that are worth dying for. And this yeah. is one of them. This is one of them. If if there was ever a time for the church to rise up, now is the time. So thanks for leading the way on the charge. And uh, you have to come back again yes. and keep me posted on all God's doing. Thank uh, you, Heidi. Keep up the good work. We're proud God of you. God bless you. Thank you, my friend. If you guys want more information on the ministry of the White Rose Resistance and the, and the person and work of Seth Gruber, you can go to HeidiStJohn.com forward slash podcast. Scroll down and I'll link to him in the show notes today, or you can just visit the White Rose Resistance. I hope you guys will put your money where your heart is and support the good work that Seth is doing. Thank you guys so much for listening. Have a great weekend. I can't imagine a better way to close out 2022 than with a call to action for 2023. And I hope you'll pray about it this weekend. God wants to use you. Love your families well. And I'll see you back here again at the intersection of faith and culture.